Okay. All right. Okay, so lessons uh, one through five, or uh, actually I should be through the all, but uh, first lesson was uh, why we pray, and certainly we pray because we're commanded to. Uh, second lesson was on powerful prayer principles, that the Lord's Prayer is not something that we memorize just for the sole purpose of reciting it. Um, we know that God can do everything and we can do nothing. Um, I am his servant and begin and end our prayers with praise of God. And then uh, don't worry about the length of prayers. I've seen a lot of guys get themselves messed up trying to, you know, make it sound good, so to speak. Uh, getting comfortable with God. We can have a family relationship with our uh, Heavenly Father and Abba there, we would call, you know, like Daddy. And then uh, getting to know God as Father. He's a loving Father, a correcting Father, a caring Father, a comforting Father. And He is a Father that we must uh, emulate. Uh, certainly, if we're calling ourselves Christians, we want to be Christ-like. And then uh, God's address as we uh, pray, our Father which art in heaven. And then making God's name hallowed hallowed to make holy or to make separate and understanding God's kingdom last week the kingdom of God is not earthly but spiritual and then tonight accomplishing God's will on earth all right so in pursuit of powerful prayer we can look at the third uh, petition in the Lord's prayer the first and the most significant is hallowed be thy name God should be holy to us and when we go before him in prayer we need to be reminded of that we don't want to get um, uh, lacks in our in our approach to God uh, we want to remember that he is the great I am and so he, his name should be hallowed to us should be holy the second is thy kingdom come uh, and then the third thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven so how do we accomplish God's will on earth well they give us three questions to answer how does God's will come to earth what is God's will for us and what is the problem so Jesus tells us to pray, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. God doesn't accomplish his will on earth through angels. He does, uh, he does uh, ex exclusively through you and me. Uh, we should be the instrument in God's hand, so to speak. This petition of prayer, uh, uh, it's a prayer of commitment to fulfill God's purpose or will for our lives. When we say uh, uh, your will on earth as it is in heaven, we're saying that, Lord, we're committed to that that uh, philosophy, that thought, that whatever would uh, be uh, okay in heaven would be okay on earth, and that we're going to uh, be bound and determined to make sure that we uh, obey his will in our lives. So, uh, and then when we pray this sincerely, it's a prayer to, for God to take control and fulfill his purpose for our lives. So, we've all probably experienced it. Maybe even as a new Christian, you know, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? What's, uh, what, uh, what's your will in my life? And, uh, and maybe, maybe we've asked that question later in life. Maybe we were saved late uh, uh, in life. And, uh, you know, we had a guy here years ago that was saved at the age of 80. And uh, certainly a great thing because uh, as you get older and older, that's a hard thing uh, to overcome is all that time in the world. God has a purpose for us before we are even born. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And then what does the last part say? It says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We have a purpose. I don't understand uh, sometimes, um, well, I mean, I guess I do. Some people, they just don't understand necessarily that when you come to Christ through salvation, that we don't get saved by works, but works is a byproduct of salvation. When we get saved, there should be a desire to do several things. We should want to read his word. We should want to pray and talk to him. We should want to fellowship with other believers. We certainly should want to worship with other believers. Uh, and then, obviously, one of the things that we know for sure is that we should be a witness of Jesus Christ. He, he tells us that straight up in Acts 1.8. So... There are things that we should be looking to do for our Lord. And uh, how we do it and, and all these things. I, I'll admit, when I was young, I thought that ministry meant pastor. That's what I thought was meant by ministry. Uh, and, and maybe a missionary. But as I've you know, grown older, 
I've run into so many people that are doing so many interesting things as ministry. Uh, you know, we've got the guy up here that, that flies in the water purifiers uh, to third world countries. And uh, Hurston? Yeah, Joe Hurston. Uh, we've got a guy that uh, out in Oklahoma, uh, he takes uh, short-term missionary trips into Cuba, you know, five days a week, something like that. We went with him in 2003. And so there's, and I read a really, really good article on a, um, on a group of ladies been several years ago, but they go into strip joints and they go in and they say, you know, hey, can we, uh, would it be okay if we set up a meal for your girls before whatever starts? And so that's usually their way in. And then through that, they're able to win them to the Lord. And so there's all kinds of uh, ministries out there that when you read them, it's just like, and that's a great idea. That's a great thought. And uh, to be able to minister to those people. So God has an individual will uh, or purpose for each of us. And Jesus tells us to pray God's will be done in us as it is in heaven. So how is God's will fulfilled in heaven? Well, the angels do it uh, wholeheartedly, joyously, and completely. So we're, uh, we're to do God's will in earth as it is in heaven, wholeheartedly, joyously, and completely. It's... Um, there's nothing like running into or meeting a excited Christian. You know, somebody that's been uh, uh, walking with the Lord for a while and God's used them to do some great things and they're still excited about it. Um, what I have found in my experience, my opinion, my perspective, people are happiest as uh, followers of Christ if they get their hands dirty in the ministry, so to speak. If you're active in ministry, you're, you're teaching, you're mowing the grounds, you're, you're doing whatever, those are the people that are, are more satisfied with their walk with the Lord, especially those that uh, maybe take on you know, some of these new areas of ministry that never thought of before. Uh, we got a guy in town that runs, uh, it's either two or three food pantries here. He was, uh, he helped us get the food pantry in Astronaut. I know he's got one, I think, in Puerto Rico, and he's got a new one in Belize. So, uh, I mean, the guy's a go-getter, and it just really, he's just an exciting guy to be around. The primary purpose of prayer is allowing God's will to come to earth through us. That's why Jesus, knowing the cross that he must face the next day, prayed uh, this prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We know that as Christ prayed that night that it said that his sweat was like droplets of blood. It means that he was under tremendous stress. And so, again, when he prays this, this prayer, I think that sometimes maybe it's hard for us to grasp the magnitude of, of how God looks at sin with such um, hatred. You know, he hates sin. And to know that he was going to go and be made sin, uh, boy, that had to be a real, real... Um, burden. Uh, I just can't imagine. I think we we have a hard time with it because, you know, we have a sin nature and not nearly as offended as certainly as our Lord was. So what would be our fate if Jesus had not allowed God's will to be done on earth through him? Man, if he would have called for those 10,000 angels, we'd be in a mess, wouldn't we? We'd be in a mess. Our willingness to sincerely pray, not my will, but thine be done, will determine the eternal destiny of many we know. Now, I put that question in there, agree, because I don't know that I agree with that statement, that my failure in my walk with the Lord would have a, uh, a damning effect on someone else. I just don't understand how that could, could be. Uh, anyone got any thoughts on that, opinion on that, that uh, if I don't do something, then someone next down the line, Warren? If it's God's will, it's still our battle. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the way I was looking at it, because here's, here's what I looked at. In 2 Corinthians, we're told, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. I know sometimes I, I, I read about uh, some of these, uh, these uh, criminals, some of these uh, uh, serial killers and, and just horrible people, 
and you read about them and you look at their uh, their background and uh, how they what kind of family life they had growing up and uh, physically abused, mentally abused, and uh, all these things. And, and it makes me wonder. And a lot of times I'll say, Lord, I just don't know. I'm glad you're sovereign. I'm glad you're in charge because uh, I wouldn't know how to handle all that stuff. I know that whenever I read and it says, you know, fathers provoke, provoke not your children to wrath, and then dad does do that, what's the consequences? And so, uh, but I do know this, we're each going to give an account. And in Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whosoever a man, uh, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I know that we're going to be accountable for what we do in this life. Um, some things that we will reap, we will reap, we will reap in this life, and uh, I pray that that's all uh, blessings for us. Uh, but I have seen some of the uh, some of the reaping that, that people have done, and, and it's been really hard to watch. Um, but the thing of it is, is we're all accountable. We're all accountable. Uh, sometimes you run into people that I don't know. They that they act like they're not accountable to anybody, and. Uh, I've always, I learned a long, long time ago, that everybody's accountable to somebody because everybody's accountable to God. So uh, we're going to have to uh, live with that. Someone might say, what good is prayer if all I can get out of prayer is God's will? I thought prayer was to get what I want. Well, there's a lot of people out there that do think this. They may not word it like that, but the only time they spend in prayer is, you know, they got a grocery list and I need this and this. But and, and again, they may not verbalize it as such, but they're thinking that, well, I'm bringing you my needs, God. Uh, but God always wants what we want if we have enough sense to want it. And I've been there. I've done this. That for years, I was active in the church. I was a deacon in the church. I was chairman of the Christian Education Board. I was doing all kinds of stuff. But I wasn't doing what God wanted me to do. And uh, for years... I'd say, what more do you want? What more do you want? What more do you want? I knew the answer. I didn't want to talk about it. Um, and finally, he got a real good hold of me one day and said, you're going to do it whether you like it or not. You're going to do it. So uh, so we uh, we got ourselves right with the Lord, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. So as he says here is that God wants what's best for us, we should never forget, no matter what our circumstances are, that God loves us. He loved us in eternity past. He loves us today. He'll love us tomorrow. Um, God's will is often not the easiest uh, nor the most comfortable, but it is always what is best for our character. So I don't know. We've probably, again, we've all probably faced it where uh, because of our beliefs, because of our convictions, we've uh, found ourselves in situations or circumstances where uh, we either got to stand up for the Lord or we got to turn our back and walk the other way. And sometimes those, it can still make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, but I, I know that when you're faced with those moments, that if you will stand for the Lord, I know over a period of time by doing so, it almost, and, and again, if you're, if you're in the same community of people, say a business or whatever, or school or work, whatever, um, but if you're consistent in your beliefs uh, over a period of time, they, they will expect that from you. Uh, it won't be a shock to them. It won't be, you know, it's just, well, that's, that's what he believes. That's what he does. So, and, and hopefully that's uh, the testimony of our lives. God wants to bless us, make us happy. Uh, but for God to really bless us, we must be willing to submit to his will for our lives. Sometimes God's will is scary. Sometimes God's will doesn't necessarily make sense. Uh, I know years ago there was a family that was, uh, well, they were very upset with me. And, uh, and I hadn't seen them in, in several years. And it was like the Lord said, I, I need you to go visit that family. I said, no, nah, that can't be right. That don't, they caused all kinds of, we, no, that, Lord, you don't want that. And uh, it just wouldn't go away. Uh, I even drove down and, and accidentally went to the wrong house. I said, see, Lord, they moved. They, you know, you don't, they, don't, they don't want to talk to me either. It still wouldn't go away. And so uh, finally, uh, it was in the fall uh, during uh, football season, college football. 
And I remember I pulled up, I was walking up the driveway, the, uh, the door was open, screen door there, and I heard a voice inside said, come on up, brother. And it was like nothing had ever happened. I mean, it was all well. And of course, he passed away very shortly thereafter. Um, so it's one of those occasions where you learn that, okay, if God's going to put something on your heart like that, chances are he's already been there. He's already laid the foundation. He's paved the way. We just got to be faithful enough to go through it. Um, there may be difficult uh, conversations with our, our children or our spouses or whatever, um, but we know if we're faithful to God, it will work out for the best. And, uh, and we grow from those opportunities. So he does, he is going to stretch us. He is going to grow us. If we put ourselves in his hand and we say, Lord, you know, I want to live for you. I want to be committed uh, to doing uh, your will for my life, uh, then we're going to have to step out of our comfort zone sometimes. Um, so in Jeremiah 29, 11, God tells us about his plans for us. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So God has an expected end for all of us, and that end is uh, eternity in heaven. That's what his will is, all right? So when we surrender to God's will for our lives, he will prosper us spiritually, give us hope or a purpose for living, and give us a future not only uh, on earth but also in heaven. So one of the things I usually will talk to a new convert about is that, you know, the day you were born, you were born into a, a, an, ex, an uh, eternal existence. You're going to either live this life and die and go into heaven, or you're going to live this life and die and go into hell. So you're an eternal being here and now. And so uh, God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you from, from day one all the way through is what his desire is for us. But we make that hard sometimes because we, we don't live according to his will. We do things that we know are uh, contrary to his will. And then we get ourselves in trouble. And one of the things that, that fascinates me uh, in life is I'll see someone in a particular circumstance and, and they're miserable, they're hurt, they're, they're, they're damaged, and, and that situation gets separated from them, and then they turn right around and enter into the same type of, of, of problems. I said, I, what are we learning? You know, I think the Lord's trying to get your attention here. Um, so we need to be, if we'll just learn to be committed to his will, to do the things he wants us to do. Uh, we're going to be able to, number one, I tell you, you can lay down at night. You can put your head on the pillow and not, not have guilt. Uh, you can go there lying that, you know, hey, Lord, you know, we had a good day today. Uh, we cannot truly pray thy will be done on earth unless we are uh, committed to finding and fulfilling God's will or purpose for our lives because God's will comes to earth through us. So that leads us to our next question. God has a moral or a general will that is the same for all believers. And he has a special will that at least to some degree is different for each of us. So God's moral will is revealed through his word in the form of commands and principles. So the question here is at least three things of God's will for all believers. So number one, God wants us to love him because he loves us. So how does God tell us about his love for us in Jeremiah 31, uh, 3b? It says, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. God's love is everlasting. Uh, his, his love is eternal. We talk about that agape love. Again, it's a love that has no expectation of reciprocation. God loved us knowing that, you know, we were going to be a sinful bunch of people and that there would be many, many, many that would uh, refuse his uh, gift of salvation through his son. So he loves us, and more than anything else, he wants us to love him. All God ever wanted from day one was to take care of us, to uh, meet our needs, and to love us, and for us to love him. That was the purpose. And so, you know, we get ourselves in situations sometimes, and, and, and I've had people tell me that they just felt like, you know, the Lord didn't love them anymore. They, they had sinned, and they had done whatever, and so, well, no, that, that's not true. He loves you for forever. Uh, he might reprimand you, but the Bible says that, you know, a good father, you know, reprimands their child because why? They love him. Uh, I know that's what my parents did. Um, one day a scribe or expert in the law came to Jesus and asked which commandment in the law is greatest. Uh, then quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5, here's what Jesus said. 
Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Have you ever really sat down and thought about what does that look like to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Anyone? You ever think about what that looks like? Uh, I'm still learning. Still learning. Because I tell you that I know uh, the other day I witnessed something and I was just like, Lord, there's just so much hurt in this world. And, you know, I just like to be able to help in that situation. But we see people all the time that um, maybe they're hard to love. Maybe they're, maybe they're just cantankerous or, or, or maybe they're just uh, so uh, deep in misery that they don't know how to, to be loved, to allow you to love them and to help them. And so, uh, but by loving them, we begin to exercise what the Lord's commanded us to do, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, um, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, that when we love these people, when we demonstrate our love to these people, we are being an extension of his love, which brings us into that category, that, that level, if you will. This means we must love God with everything in our being. And why is uh, this commandment the greatest of all? Because our chief purpose in this life is that we are supposed to love him and to bring honor and glory to his name in everything we do, everything. I told a boss one time years ago, I said, you know what? I said, uh, the company uh, gets a good deal when they hire a Christian because that, that will be the person, the man or woman, that will come in early. They will stay late. They will never lie to you. They will never steal from you. Uh, they, will be, they will break their backs. You benefit, but they're doing it for his glory. That's the whole purpose, right? So, uh, and that's how we should approach anything. I know that through the years, I've had this conversation more than once uh, during a work day, or we've remodeled the parsonage once or twice, and uh, I'll hear somebody, usually in, in a state of frustration, say, well, that's good enough. And I'll have to say, well, let me ask you one question. Is it good enough for your house? And if the answer to that is no, then it's certainly not good enough for God's house. And so we need to press on. And uh, So if we love God as the Bible teaches, we will naturally want God's will to come uh, to earth through us. I don't know about you, but when we are doing things and, uh, and we're successful at those things, and maybe just in the smallest way, I always look at it as, okay, God's got his hand on it and God's given us his approval because we're seeing some, some benefit from this. I've actually got on my phone right now, I started a list a while back um, as we were faced with some of these difficulties last year with insurance and the lightning strike and, and and all these things and I just I like to remind myself keep an eye on how God's going to bless you just keep an eye and uh, so I've been jotting those things down and uh, just as a reminder and it's just about every week these days I'm telling you the Lord is so good to us uh, in regard to some of these specific areas so we want to we want to see God's will uh, done in our lives but I also think that we want to uh, be good stewards, if you will, of tracking God's love through the day. Number one, if you're living, you know, hey, you, you got blessed right off the bat. You got out of bed. Uh, again, uh, I like to remind myself sometimes I go to the refrigerator, open the door, I get something to eat, manna from heaven, because there's, there's millions and millions of people in the world that cannot do that. Uh, there's millions that, that, you know, they don't know where their next bite of food is going to come from. Um, I can go anywhere in this town, pull out a piece of plastic, and get whatever I want, you know. And, uh, and again, there's people that can't even come close to that kind of freedom. And so uh, we know we should, we should uh, bask in his love and, and show great appreciation for how well uh, God treats us. I have found myself laying in bed at night. Sometimes, sometimes I just cry. I just say, Lord, I don't know why you're so good to me. I don't know. I certainly had, don't deserve it, but, man, you, you have given me uh, just so much. Uh, God wants us to be like his son. He wants us to be like Jesus. Uh, he doesn't want us to dress like Jesus or look like Jesus. He wants us to have the character of Jesus. And um, that's why I have a hard time sometimes with, with uh, 
uh, being around uh, people that tell me they're Christian, but maybe they're profane. And, uh, and I just have a hard time. I just, I think about it. I said, I just, I have a hard time uh, hearing my Lord be profane. Um, I know Jesus got angry. I know he threw the money changers out of the temple, but I don't hear him being profane in that. I just don't get, I just don't see that. Um, so the Bible tells us we should know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. This is Romans 8.28. And I've said it a lot that I think that, number one, I think it's a very misused uh, scripture. I think people try to comfort people maybe at the wrong time by, by bringing this one up. Um, but at the same time, I really, really think that this is a very powerful verse that if we, um, if we fully accept it, understand it, and commit to it, that it will give us a different perspective on no matter what happens in our life, that uh, if God chooses to put us in a valley uh, to have us to walk through a course of some difficulty, and we know what this verse says, we understand this verse, we trust this verse, and we know that, uh, number one, uh, if I love the Lord, I'm here because I love him, and he loves me. And if I do love him, I'm going to trust that whatever I have to go through, it's for the glory of his kingdom. There's going to be some good come out of this. Because, again, we don't, have, we don't always know who's watching us. We don't always know who's encouraged by us. Uh, sometimes it will catch you off guard, and I hope you've experienced that. Uh, because, you know, I've thought many times, I've thought to myself, said, how in the world can I, without freaking people out, how in the world could I hold a funeral for people before they die? And, you know, you go to someone's funeral and, uh, man, all, nothing but good things. You know, no one talks about what a stinker they were, you know, and all this stuff. They all talk about what a great guy he was or she was and all this stuff. And I thought, man, I wonder if those are things that we tell people before that day. You know, do we tell them, hey, I really appreciate who you are, what you stand for, the example you give for me. And... Uh, because I tell you, one of the things that God has done for me my entire life is that he has put uh, men in front of me uh, that were godly men, that were good leaders, um, people that even when I was in the Army that took good care of us. Um, and so I've always, always been thankful for that, that uh, no matter what stage I am in my life, God has always either uh, given me a good mentor or he surrounded me with good Christian men. Uh, to help me in my growth. And boy, that's just a, that's a, a wonderful thing to be part of. And so, uh, here it says that we can't understand this verse unless we read the first part of the next verse, Romans uh, 8.29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. Um, and so as you go through scripture and you read and you study about Christ, it seems to me that one of the, one of the things that jumps out at me anyway is that when our Lord spoke, he spoke with such, in such a way he, that they understood his authority, they felt his power, um, and, but people didn't, uh, Jesus didn't bully people. You know, if there was somebody that had sin in their life, he would just be matter-of-factly about it and, uh, and give them the opportunity. And uh, how many times did you hear him say, you know, thy faith has made thee whole, you know, apart. And, uh, and he what, didn't get into, you know, didn't get into how, how bad they were or anything like that. The woman brought to him and taken in adultery, you know, the way he treated her. Um, and sometimes, you know, if we would uh, be able to emulate that, uh, especially, you know, if it's uh, maybe uh, a family member or something, because I don't know about you, I get tend to be a little bit more emotional with family. But uh, to be able to do that, to be able to look sin in the eye and to be able to address it in a godly manner and to, uh, to you know, love them like Jesus loves them. The phrase all things in Romans 8.28 doesn't mean that all things that happen to us are good because they're, they're certainly not. We have some things that happen to us that aren't enjoyable. Uh, it doesn't mean everything that happens to us in this fallen world is God's will, because it's not. But 
it does mean that God will use everything that happens to us, good or bad, to mold our character and make us more like Jesus. I can remember like it was like yesterday. Um, uh, I, met, I met Brother Milt, John's father-in-law, out at work. Uh, they were doing some restructuring, and they had paired uh, Brother Milt and me together, and I had never seen him before in my life, and uh, put us in charge of the midnight shift. And that shift had a lot of problems, and they sent us down there to clean it up. And, uh, and just in a heartbeat, I had all these grievances and stuff, and I was just bemoaning the fact. I, was, I took them all personal. I didn't understand the process, and I was just feeling beat up pretty good. And I remember sitting there, and I, I looked at Brother Milt, and I said, you know, Milt, I think the Lord's you know, putting me through this because he's got something else in mind for me. And he just kind of smiled at me like he had some kind of inside knowledge. I don't know. But, uh, but the Lord will. He'll take these things. We're struggling with something. And I like to call them times to define our faith. Uh, when we're put in a situation and there's a, there's a godly way we can approach it or there's a, a fleshly way we can approach it, uh, we can be spiritual, we can be emotional. And as we go through it and as we look back on the, on the experience, we can say to ourselves, okay, I think I handled that the way a Christian man or woman should. Or, you know, Lord, I, I don't think I really was as strong through that as I should have been. Uh, I, don't think I, I don't think I reflected your image very well during that. And so, you know, help me to grow from that. Help me to learn from that. And, uh, and some people are quick learners. Some people are a little bit slower learners. I tend to be on the slow side sometimes. Uh, but I always appreciate so much that the Lord uh, gives me the opportunity to uh, redeem uh, the next opportunity. So when we understand this, the problems and pains of life can take on a completely new meaning. I, uh, uh, just, I just learned this the other day when I was talking to Dawn, and she was telling me that she was having a conversation with mom. Uh, our mom passed about a little over a year ago with dementia. And... Um, she said that mom had told her one time, said, well, you know, this is the life that God has asked me to live. And because we never heard a complaint from her. And, you know, and I just thought, wow. I said, Romans 8, 28, man, you know, that's someone right there that, that got it. Uh, and I think what, a, what a, a gift that is, too, because as we face difficulty like that, we have to understand that, you know, the Lord's still with us. So God does have a divine purpose for uh, every problem or pain that he allows us to experience. He's molding us. You know, he's the potter, we're the clay. And uh, he's helping us to, uh, to develop particular skills. Remember when, uh, when the Lord begins talking about equipping this church, um, not everybody was the pastor. You know, not everybody can be uh, the piano player or the, uh, the bass player or whatever. Uh, the way I look at it is I think, I think God equips the church He's equipped this church to do the ministries that we do in a manner that can be pleasing to him. And as we grow and as he sends us uh, a more diversity of gifts, then obviously we can expand ministry along those lines. But I just think that God, he, he gives us what we need. Um, when we have a problem or tragedy, we do need to ask ourselves, you know, how can God use this to make me more like Jesus? I can tell you many years ago, I, you know, trying to, live this life there's been many times where i've asked the lord said lord i don't know what i'm supposed to learn through this but please open my eyes help me to understand help me to learn what it is that you've got for me uh and then usually it's something like because i don't know how much more of this i can take right but uh and, he, and he's faithful to do that he's faithful to to grow us through those uh, situations to be more like jesus we must be forgiving um if you've ever been hurt or betrayed by someone, uh, it, can be a, it can be a devastating thing. Uh, we've talked many times how church, there's nothing worse in the world than church hurt, as far as I'm concerned. Someone that you trust, someone that you look up to, someone that you admire, and then something happens. Um, but certainly if we're hurt or betrayed, you know, we, uh, you know the old adage, well, what would Jesus do? Well, yeah, well, he would forgive them. Uh, and we know this because of Luke 23, 34, when Jesus uh, on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. So even on the cross, Jesus was forgiving. And sometimes we, um, I, have, I have known people that have been in, immersed in so much pain 
uh, over the fact that they could not forgive somebody uh, or they would not. And I've prayed with people at the altar and and them just just bawling like babies. And, you know, I, I wish I could forgive, you know, this person for that or that person for this. And, and I just can't do it. I can't do it. And I'm like, man, you know, this is eating you alive. Uh, you need to let the Lord have this. And so uh, we got to be careful about wanting to um, have revenge. Uh, I think pride has a lot to do with this. I think that sometimes people, when they get offended, that uh, their pride kicks in. Well, you can't let them treat you like that. Who, who, who do they think you are and all that? And so we begin to let our, our ego you know, play into the equation when, no, uh, it takes great strength to be forgiving. It really does. And um, I know that I've, I've had to go through that a couple of times in my life, and, uh, and I've had people that you know, I needed to, to forgive me uh, in my life. And, but I will tell you this, that those people that I've had that type of interaction with, we were stronger afterwards. We were closer afterwards. Uh, because I know in my, my perspective, I had a great deal of respect for this person and uh, you know, apologizing and what have you. And I just thought, man, now that's a godly guy right there. And so I really, really do admire that. Is it God's will for us to be more forgiving? Of course it is. Uh, how does he teach us to be forgiving? Well, he allows us to get hurt sometimes. And uh, I would tell you, and I'm, I'm as confident about this as anything else I know, that over the years I've seen a lot of people uh, get upset in church be offended in church. Um, and when you would talk to them, well, so-and-so did this or so-and-so did that. And, and usually the first question I will ask them, I said, well, let's talk about so-and-so for a minute. Um, I've known so-and-so for a while and so have you. And I think they're a good uh, godly man or woman. And the first question I would ask you is this, knowing who they are, knowing their character, knowing their love for the Lord, do you think it was purposeful on their part to hurt you or maybe we just have a misunderstanding taking place here and if you can get them to go and have that conversation with someone uh, nine times out of ten you're gonna find look just a misunderstanding uh, a different perspective um, and certainly no intent of offending or hurting or harming someone with intention and uh, so we need to learn to not let our pride or our emotions lead the way I've had that you know, conversation with folks that as a mature believer in Jesus Christ, we are to be guided by his word, not our emotions. And so, uh, you know, in my case, you know, I had to learn to, to just be quiet for a while and go home and, and open the Bible and, and do some reading and because I always wanted to have a godly response to whatever was taking place. And so uh, it's just one of those things that you go through so Jesus likes us to be patient. Um, Jesus left that, the throne of heaven and uh, where there's no sin, pain, tears, and, and faithfully lived in this sinful world. And it caused him many tears and much pain for 33 years. You remember his family didn't buy into it. His siblings didn't buy into him being the Messiah right out of the, the uh, shoot there. And so God makes us like Jesus by allowing delays, disappointments, long-term problems. And that's why God tells us in Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So, listen, sometimes doing well can become monotonous. You know, you get involved in, in maybe teaching a class, and, uh, and you're into your third or fourth year, and you're like, man, Lord, that's just, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I'm not seeing any results. I don't think that uh, I don't think that uh, I'm the person to do what you've asked me to do. Uh, there's got to be somebody better at this. Well, let me let me answer your question. Number one, is there somebody better to do that? Yes, there is. God's always got somebody better, but right now He's using you. Right now He's got you in that seat because He's got uh, either a a idea to grow you to something else or he's got someone in line that you're going to interact with. Uh, so, yeah, God can get somebody better. But the truth is, you know, and, and I tell you this after almost 17 years here, is that I've had this conversation with God a number of times. 
And he keeps saying, just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, and it's easy to get drawn into the idea that as a pastor, as a Sunday school teacher, uh, as a deacon, uh, that we're not successful if uh, we don't have a church of 500. And how do, you, how do you define success as a believer in Jesus Christ? Well, I can tell you how. Uh, are you being obedient to his will? Uh, he doesn't call us to reap the harvest. He call, calls us to go out and sow, right? Uh, we'll get to do a little sowing. We get to do a little watering. And when God really blesses, we get to do a little reaping, right? And what a blessing that is. But what we've been asked to do is be faithful. That's what we've been asked to do. And if we will learn that and abide by that, then I think that's when God starts using you. That, okay, this person's finally learned that. Um, because what, I don't know about you, but what happens with preconceived notions? You know, I, listen, when I started here 17 years ago, like I said, I just answered the call to preach a couple of years before that. And I thought, well, okay, well, I'll just go up there and I'll, I'll preach and I'll just be a good example. I'll work hard. And people will just fall right in line, and boy, I'll be like Mother Goose or whatever. And you know what? Ah, it didn't work that way. You know, people are people, and people got different ideas and, and thoughts and, and all this stuff. And I had to get smarter, and uh, I, I, th I think I've gotten some smarter. I won't claim too much. but um, So God wants us to help others to faith in Christ. And, of course, this right here, this should be one of the things that, that drives us, that that will not allow us to uh, uh, to get discouraged and to quit. Uh, I was thinking about my children, you know, uh, when they were little, man, I hated to discipline them. I hated it. Um, and I would get angry. And a lot of times my anger was because I didn't want to do it, but I felt like I couldn't let them down. I said, man, if you don't discipline, you're, you're letting them down. You're, you're you're setting them up for failure if you don't discipline them and show them that there's boundaries in this world and what have you. And I think that uh, that, that think, thinking goes a long ways as far as leading others to faith in Christ. Listen, you can, you can be a witness to them. You can share them the gospel. You can be a witness before them in the way that you live your, your life. Um, and even in people that you have, maybe you've had difficulty in, in speaking with, maybe... I'm not talking about a uh, confrontational, just they don't believe, and you do, and you've tried, and they're not interested. Uh, and what I've always thought and what I've always tried to do is when I run into that is just, okay, let's maintain a posture of ministry. Let's don't get into an argument. Let's don't break, break you know, uh, destroy that relationship. Let's, let's keep it. And, and to at least right now we can have conversations. I can still be an example to this person's life. Uh, and then when they get to that point in their life where, Maybe tragedy strikes, maybe where they begin to ask about uh, to themselves about what eternity holds for them, then they will know that based on their interaction with you, well, there's a person I can go to because I've witnessed it in their life. And so that's a very important place to be in, is that you maintain the posture of ministry. I used to tell our, our deacons when I was in Melbourne, um, we had a neighbor that, man, this person, they... They hated the church. They hated us. And they would do all kinds of things to disrupt us. And they even sued us one time. And I remember telling the deacon, said, listen, we got lawyers. The lawyers will handle this. We, keep, we, we maintain the posture to minister. And I'd been up here a few years, and Brother Steve called me one evening and said, guess what happened? I said, well, he said, uh, I forget the gentleman's name now, but he came in church and he got saved. And uh, I said, well, so, well, it took a while, but we got him, you know. And so that's always exciting. But uh, you've got to maintain that posture to where you have that opportunity. It may be years, years down the road before you get the, to see um, that harvest that you're looking for, see that person come to Christ. I don't know how many years I talked to Brother Allen before he got saved, and uh, he was a tough one. And so we don't want to get weary in well-doing. So we know Christ came into the world to save sinners. And that's what we all are. We're all sinners. You know, he came for us. Uh, he not only came to save us from the penalty of our sins, but also that we might have a, a happy and abundant life because, uh, it's further down, uh, if we want God's will to be done on earth, we can never forget what fact about uh, God in 2 Peter 3, 9. 
It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward and willing um, that any, sh- not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I, I, every time I come across this verse, I think about Brother uh, Roger. He was a deacon here years ago. Um, his brother Richard is, is attending with us now. But Roger told me one time he was over in, at Walmart and he was waiting on Sister Marty to shop and he was sitting on one of them benches up in the front and there was an older gentleman there and they got to talking and he began to witness to him and, and this guy was, if I remember the story right, this guy was like 80s or 90s and um, he said, son, I've heard that all my life. I've heard that, son, uh, that all my life that he's coming and he's coming and here we still are. But well, that was some of the complaints of some of the, of the Jews. Um, but it's not God's will that any should perish. So when someone tells me that I've gone too far, I've sinned too great, there's no sin too greater than God's grace, we know that. Um, there are some that I worry about. And I've got one that I pray for daily that just I'm afraid that this person has, well, they have. They've said the words on Facebook that they've renounced you know, Christ and it just makes me my stomach just turn, uh, so I'm I'm very concerned about that person. Um, but it's hard for me to to grasp how that go. But we know that when uh, Peter says that you know that our Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we're not going to get into this tonight. But that right there is a interesting statement to start talking about, isn't it, guys? So Jesus came to give us life in John 10, uh, 10 um, and that means that we're not, and we're not living until we understand that in John 10, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And I've told you the story a number of times, usually whenever I get in here uh, on this particular verse for sure. Um, we had a young girl that came to this church for many years when we were younger. Uh, she got married, they moved away. Uh, she was my sister's best friend in high school and they stayed in touch. Well, she got sick with cancer, and she suffered with cancer like three years, I think. She was a school teacher. Um, her husband had divorced her, and she was uh, trying to, you know, raise two teen, uh, one teen girl, one close preteen. And then, um, so when she got sick and they had her in hospice, uh, uh, his, her mother asked me if I'd do the funeral, so I drove over there, and I was talking to them, and they were telling me her favorite verses, and they were telling me that, John uh, chapter 10 was her favorite chapter. And I remember sitting there studying this and looking at this and thinking, Lord, how was uh, Charmin's life more abundant? And so I'm in the midst of running back and forth and studying, and uh, and then it kind of just hit me. While I'm sitting there in this hospice room with this young lady, uh, her co-workers are coming by and family and all this, and all I kept hearing over and over and over again was the smile on her face, and she had witness on, uh, testimony on her tongue. She was always uh, praising Jesus and witnessing to people about Jesus and very pleasant during her uh, horrible time that she had. Um, but I thought to myself, okay, Lord, I get it. You know, cancer with Jesus is much different than cancer without Jesus. There's a big difference there, folks, a big difference. Um, cancer without Jesus, there ain't no hope. You know, there's no hope. Um, cancer with Jesus? Yeah, we know that he's got something good waiting for us. And uh, I just pray that that can be everyone's testimony uh, as, they, as they get to the end of their life. So what's the problem? Well, we all have a natural desire to be our own boss. We want to do our own thing. We want to ignore God's will. And, you know... I can remember as a, as a kid, you know, I couldn't wait to turn 18. I couldn't wait to, you know, be my own boss and, and make decisions in life. And I don't know, probably uh, a couple of uh, years down the road, I was thinking, boy, I wish I could go back home and let dad be in charge for a while, you know, and, and feel that security. But we want to, we want to do our own thing. And, and that's natural. Um, and we hear these phrases, uh, you know, looking out for number one, do your own thing. If it feels good, do it. Um, and then they point out Frank Sinatra's song, I Did It My Way. Um, 
I think if we can get to the point in our life where we say, you know, I'm doing things God's way, uh, boy, that's, that's a great place to be. Um, I know that we're never going to be perfect, uh, not in this life. He's taking us to that point. Uh, and we know that we won't be complete until we stand before our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we're complete. So that's, that's the goal. That's the, uh, that's the brass ring, so to speak. So, we, you know, we want to do things our way and not God's way. Uh, but then here's what Isaiah says. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And uh, as I shared with you last week in, in uh, the book of Judges four times, it says that, you know, uh, the people were, were evil and, and uh, uh, did things their own way. I pre- I'm paraphrasing. But that is a problem in this world is that, when you have 20 people and 20 people want to go in 20 different directions, it's hard to get anywhere. It's hard to get anywhere. And so, uh, but if those 20 people are all submitted to one God, then we can do something with that. We can, we can honor God with that. I've said it all, all my life. I said, you know, uh, I, don't need, I don't need people to agree with me on everything. I don't need that. Uh, what I need people to be focused on is Jesus Christ. We can have differences in the church. We can have different opinions about things. But if we're focused on the cross of Calvary, if we're focused on our job, our mission, uh, to be witnesses of Jesus Christ in this world, uh, we can all be unified by that, uh, by that calling. And certainly that's what I would um, want to see in our lives. So we fix the problem by praying uh, these first three phrases of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, our Father, which art in heaven reminds us that he's a loving father who wants only the best for us. And then we ask, you know, we pray, hallowed be thy name. Uh, we're reminding ourselves that we don't want to get uh, too comfortable with him in the, in the state that we, uh, I should say, too casual with him. Uh, we don't want to be arrogant when we go before God's presence, you know, making demands and uh, uh, forgetting whom we are addressing. You know, sometimes uh, when I pray, I hear myself say, you know, Lord, instead of saying, Lord, please do this, and, well, Lord, I need this done, I need that done. No, that's, that's, that's telling, that ain't asking. And uh, so we need to be uh, careful how we approach our Lord. And then we pray thy kingdom come just to acknowledge that God is Lord or he's our king and we are subjects in his kingdom. And then only then can we sincerely pray thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We can, um, we can make mistakes in our life, and we certainly we have and we will. Um, but if our desire, if our desire is to uh, please God, to do according to his, his will, his commands, um, and can I just say this to you, that one thing that I would, that what I would tell you is this, is that as a, as a part of the body of Christ, as a member of this local body, if you love one another, uh, if I love you like I'm supposed to, you love me like I'm supposed, like you're supposed to, and I mess up, I do something wrong, I have a failure of some kind. That won't, that love will not disappear. That love will um, hold me accountable. That love will look for me to be uh, uh, to help me get back up on my feet. Uh, I heard a guy preach one time, and I tr- honestly, I didn't go back and really trace it all out. But uh, they say that after our, our Lord's uh, uh, death and burial and on through the resurrection, that every time you read about Peter, you read about John. It's like, uh, and this guy's point was is that he believed that John was always there because Peter was so upset about him denying the Lord uh, three times on that night. And... Uh, so that was just the point he was making that um, there's people throughout the Bible. Every time you see Andrew just about, what's Andrew doing? He's introducing somebody to the Lord, isn't he? His brother. Um, um, my mind's going to go blank on me. But anyways, he's introducing people. Um, look at Barnabas. Barnabas was the guy that was kind of the uh, go-between, if you will, between uh, Paul when he got saved and the apostles, and so he was kind of uh, facilitating that relationship and stuff, and to kind of 
uh, speak on behalf of, of Paul to, uh, to get him into the group or what have you. And so there's, um, there's many ways that we can serve the Lord. Um, and, and, and I love the story about uh, the guy that led uh, D.O. Moody to the Lord, and I can't ever remember his name, but he said it was the worst attempt he had made at trying to witness to someone uh, when D.L. accepted the Lord as his Savior. And we know Moody, he led uh, in the numbers I gave us uh, last Sunday, you know, over a million people to the Lord. And so you might not be that, that great person that everyone's going to know your name or whatever, but that's not the point. The point is, is that if you're faithful to lead people to, to Christ, personally, what I've said to the church is that you want to do something significant for the kingdom of God, you lead a dad to, to Christ. You lead a father to the Lord because that can impact three generations. Three generations. They say it takes three generations to, to drive sin out of a, out of a uh, household, uh, but you can impact them with a godly influence. If, if, uh, how many times in the Bible do you read where somebody got saved and their family? And their family. And their family. Right? And so that, of course, is what we want. We want to see uh, godly dads uh, raising godly kids uh, that uh, result in godly uh, grandchildren. So how does God's will uh, come to earth? Well, through us as his instruments, and certainly we should be honored to be that. Uh, what's God's will for us? God wants us to love him. He wants us to, to be like Jesus by being more forgiving, more patient, more diligent in bringing others to Christ. Let me just say a word about that uh, thing about that word patient is that people are people and people have different um, speeds or, or how they grow in the Lord uh, based on their experience, their willingness to study, their desire and what have you. And it's incumbent upon us. Uh, I will tell you this, if you lead someone to the Lord, you've got a task on your hand now. Because usually when you lead someone to the Lord, there's usually a bond there that's pretty special. Brother Harold Woods will be special to me until I leave this world. Uh, but when I was a kid, I was afraid of him. I was afraid of him in his church. You know, he was the big deacon. You know, uh, I didn't want to mess up in front of him. Uh, but then I am at 13, he's leading me to the Lord. And so, um, very, very precious man to me. And so, we take that on. And... And when there's bumps in the road, you just don't wipe your hands. You, you, you get them up and you dust them off and, and you walk with them and uh, encourage them. So what's our problem? Well, we have a tendency to, to want to do our own thing. And, uh, and that's, that probably befalls us all at some point for sure. Uh, and then they ask the question if you can sincerely pray this prayer. So prayer... is obviously our interaction with God. Um, when we look at that five finger uh, thing, I think, I don't know if I still got it on here. Let me see if I put it on. No. Okay. I forgot. But anyway, one of the last one was listening. Is that when we're praying, you know, uh, not only are we praising God, we're thanking God, and then we're um, uh, prayer of intervention for others and then the last one is that and then there's confession and I'm forgetting one but then the sixth one is listening Lord uh, yeah Lord we uh, help us to hear you you know so praise thanksgiving uh, confession uh, intercession and petition and the last one is listening thank you and so we want God to speak to us and then I don't know about you guys, I, I would say that if you're faithful Bible, Bible studiers, that you're, you're, you're reading, you're studying, and you're praying. You know, uh, I know I say a lot of, Lord, help me to understand this, Lord, you know, help me to, uh, to, to get a good grasp on this one. Uh, or let it, Lord, you know, let me preach this with your power. And, uh, but when we're talking to the Lord, we also, I think that puts us in a pos position. If we're, if we're um, humbled ourselves before God, in our prayer, and it puts us in a position where we can hear him, and that's where we want to be. We want to we want to listen. Uh, it's not a one-sided conversation by any means.